Yes, we are now live. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, congratulations to the organizers of this uh, conference. It has been wonderful. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my research with all of you. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to combine genomic, phenomic, and fossil data, specifically to uh, further our, our understanding of the evolutionary history of sea urchins. Um, and much of what I'm going to talk about um, stems from two major developments that happened in the field of phylogenetics in the last uh, 10, 15 years. And those are, on the one hand, uh, the, the advent of the genomic revolution that has allowed us to infer robust phylogenies uh, with thousands of loci for uh, living biodiversity. And on the other hand, the development of novel approaches to incorporate extinct lineages in the process of uh, phylogenetic inference and in the process of time calibration. And the reality is that even though these two different approaches have radically transformed the way we approach many questions in phylogenetics, they have developed largely in isolation. So people trying to perform total evidence, tip dating analysis, and articulate extinct and extant lineages have largely disregarded phylogenomic data sets, and people working on phylogenomics have rarely turned into um, the fossil record for anything else other than uh, to, uh, as a means to constrain the, the, the time of diversion of, of certain nodes. And I, I think this is rather problematic because we know that fossils have a huge importance uh, in, in helping us understand evolutionary history. Um, the vast majority of species that ever existed are now extinct. And so if we focus exclusively on the species that happen to be alive today, we're starting uh, our, our seek to understand these evolutionary processes by reducing the, 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 the evolutionary history that we're actually spanning, the one that we have access to dramatically, reducing it to less than 1%. And so it's, it's, it should come as no surprise that incorporating the extinct diversity can drastically transform uh, how we think uh, evolution happened in the deep past. And from a phylogenetic perspective, uh, we showed in a publication this year um, that the relationships among extant lineages that we infer from morphological data are systematically different whether or not we decide to also include fossil taxa in the analysis. So, so that fossils do in fact modify significantly the topology that we obtain among extant taxa. And this was corroborated uh, across different methods of inference and using different empirical data sets. And we have since extended this line of research um, uh, into the realm of simulations. And we are now have some results that, that prove um, that phylogenies that that include uh, any, any number of fossil uh, terminals are significantly more accurate than phylogenies that are built exclusively from extant taxa. And this is true regardless of the method of inference that we choose, whether it's maximum parsimony, Bayesian inference, or tip dated analyses, regardless of the amount of fossil data, uh, of missing data. Uh, it, it truly seems as though fossils are crucial to, uh, in allowing us to extract phylogenetic signal from uh, small morphological data sets. Um, of course, uh, they're also the main sources of, of information to calibrate phylogenies, whether it's through traditional note dating methods or total, more recently through total evidence dating approaches. And from a macroevolutionary perspective, uh, we know also that fossils strongly modify ancestral state reconstructions and ultimately can modify our understanding of how evolution of the evolutionary history of, of morphology, ecology, and biogeography, all of which to some extent depend on methods of ancestral state reconstruction. They can also weigh heavily in our understanding of diversification dynamics, as well as modes of macroevolution. So for example, whether continuous traits evolve in a phylogeny under some sort of passive drift uh, as captured by a Brownian motion or whether they uh, they're evolve under, the, under an, uh, some sort of active trend, for example, towards larger or smaller values. These two different modes of macroevolution cannot be statistically distinguished if we only have ultrametic trees. So if we have trees that only sample X and taxa. So as you can see, fossils modify every single step in the, in the average, the typical um, macroevolutionary pipeline from inferring the tree to time calibrating it to infer evolutionary processes from those phylogenies. 
And my work uh, focuses mostly on uh, exploring the evolutionary history of sea urchins. And the reason why I chose this group is because I think they can become uh, a model clade with which to tackle evolutionary questions in deep time. And the reason why I think this is so is because not only do they have a good extant diversity so that we can gather phylogenomic data sets and constrain the relationships uh, among the, the living clades, but they also have a high fossilization potential so that we, we can pinpoint with, with relative uh, precision the time of origin of certain morphologies, the time of extinction of clades. And they also have a complex morphology so that we can actually combine molecular, stratigraphic, and morphological together, uh, all together into simultaneous analysis that provide phylogenetic frameworks that can account for the entire evolutionary history of the clade, both living and extinct. And the reality is that, although this sounds really promising, um, for a long time we had no clue where to place many of the main lineages of sea urchins. And that was so because morphology and molecular data systematically disagreed um, um, in, in the topology of some of the earliest nodes of the echinoid tree of life. And here by molecular data, I'm, I'm talking about uh, small studies using just a handful of genes, mostly ribosomal mitochondrial data. And to resolve this, uh, a few years ago, we published the first phylogenomic analysis of this clade, uh, ultimately based in, in about a thousand orthologous loci. And we obtained the exact same uh, topology, regardless of method of choice. So this, this topology was corroborated using coalescent-based methods, as well as concatenation under site homogeneous and site heterogeneous models. And we found that it actually showed very strong phylogenetic signal against traditionally accepted morphological hypotheses that this signal was distributed across the entire genome. So there seemed to be no, no reason to suspect this was due to some sort of outlier loci. We also tested for systematic biases and we couldn't really find any evidence that that was playing a role. So we were, we were very confident that we had actually resolved the true tree of the, of the lineages that we sampled. And this topology resolved some of these conflicted, conflicting clades in the exact same position as had been suggested previously using uh, small uh, molecular data sets. And so we're happy with this result because it drastically reduced uh, the topological uncertainty we, we were dealing with. But on the other hand, it also opened up a large number of uncertainties in many other ways. And, and to explain myself better why I think this is so, I'm going to focus uh, for now exclusively on this small clay at the bottom. And this is the clay that contains the sand dollars. Um, I hope you're all familiar with the sand dollars. Um, they're an extremely derived group of sea urchins. They don't look like other sea urchins. They don't do things like other sea urchins. Uh, and to some extent, the unique features uh, that are characteristic of, of, their, of their very derived body plan are shared with another lineage known as the sea biscuits. And so since the time of Agassi, some 200 years ago, um, it was never doubted that the sand dollars and the sea biscuits were sister to each other. And in fact, this was corroborated uh, by multiple morphological phylogenies and well supported in this, in this analysis with, with several uh, unique morphological synapomorphies. And this node uh, containing the sea biscuits and the sand dollars in all these phylogenies was subtended by a diversity of extinct and extant clade uh, lineages collectively known as the casiduloids, and the important here is on, on the quotation marks because this was never thought to be a monophyletic clade, by rather, but rather some sort of paraphyletic grade leading up to the origin of uh, the sea biscuits and the sand dollars. And the problem is that we corroborated with our phylogenomic analysis that at least some extant casiduloids are more closely related to the sand dollars than the sea biscuits are. And you can see that this topology is very problematic. Um, and it left several questions unresolved uh, that we couldn't answer. Um, the first of this, the most obvious, is how do we reconcile this topology with morphological evidence? So like I, I, like I said before, sea biscuits and sand dollars are united by, in morphological phylogenies, are united by uh, a set of, of unique synapomorphies, including their ex extreme test uh, flattening, the fact that they have uh, this unique uh, support structures that fill part of the internal structure of the test. Uh, the fact that they have teeth, so this sort of star-like structure in the center of the test um, that you're seeing at the bottom is part of the truth apparatus. And so all these um, features that are shared by these two taxa that are not found anywhere else, or at least not in any other closely related taxa, 
in the molecular tree must have ar arisen uh, through some sort of homoplasy event. We, but we don't really know whether they evolved twice independently in each group or whether they have a common or origin and then were subsequently reversed in some of the deciduoids. We also don't know what to do with the remainder of the deciduoid diversity. So this on the right is a morphological tree. And what I'm showing you in yellow are the sand dollars. In red, you can see the sea biscuits. And we've shown that this lineage over here, the lamp urchins or echinolamptariids, uh, that lineage uh, specifically in our phylogenomic analysis falls as sister to the sand dollars. Um, but it's not clear what that change in position of this specific lineage does to the position of all of the other deciduous, which is everything else that's shown, that is shown here in this uh, morphological tree. Um, specifically because casigillos are, are not monophyletic, moving around one lineage doesn't really tell you where the others should go. So possibly part of this diversity also needs to be included within this clade, but we don't know exactly which ones should be included, included and which are correctly resolved as being outside of that clade. And the other question uh, that we're left us with is, uh, we don't know when the last common ancestor of the sandars and the Sibiscuits uh, lived. So as you can see, neither one of these two clades has any fossil record before the Eocene. Um, the inclusion of the lamp urchins within this lineage already implies a fossil gap of, rather, of, of, of something like 25 million years. So, so for 25 million years, we know those, those lineages must have existed, but we have no known fossil record for them, which is starting to become a little bit problematic, but it's probably something we can live with. But we don't know which of these other lineages should also be included here. And depending on which ones do resolve in that lineage, we could be dealing with uh, ghost rangers of more than 100 million years, which is uh, very implausible. But it's something that we cannot resolve with traditional note dating approaches because we don't know which one of all this fossil diversity uh, is actually formative of the time of divergence of this node um, separating the sand dollars and the sea biscuits. And so I hope that with this example, you can see that this is the typical example in which we would like molecular morphological and stratigraphic data to simultaneously determine the topology that we favor. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to build a tree uh, using a total evidence dating approach. And then I'm going to use that tree uh, to explore the macroevolutionary history of the body. And so with this first objective, we, we've built this novel phylogenomic framework that changes the position of many clades. And we'd like to be able to extend this framework into uh, and incorporate lineages that have no molecular data, mostly fossil organisms, but also uh, extant taxa for which we don't have molecular data yet. Uh, but also specifically explore phylogenetic components through a joint analysis of all these distinct data sources. And, and the problem that we face here is we, we can gather a morphological data set. There, there was one readily available. We did not code these characters ourselves. Uh, but we did gather a stratigraphic data set with both tip dates and note dates. And at this time, we had a, already had a genomic data set with almost 2,500 loci. And the problem in combine, uh, that we face when we want to combine all of this data set into a total evidence dating uh, uh, framework is that this type of analysis are extremely computationally intensive. So typically, they only include somewhere between 5 and 25 loci. Um, so in order to do this type of analysis, we somehow need to meaningfully subsample the molecular data set to roughly 1% of its size, uh, which, is not, which is not an easy task. We need to go to this massive data set and find the best 1% of genes. And so we went into the low size subsampling literature, and we, we, we saw that most people that have faced similar problems have favored uh, approaches to subsampling that were based on single properties. And there's sort of two flavors to this uh, approach. Some people have sought to minimize systematic biases, and we have here on the x-axis one such systematic bias, the average, average pairwise patristic distance of the gene tree, which gives us some, some sort of idea of how prone a gene is to suffer from long branch attraction artifacts. And alternatively, on the y-axis, we have a proxy of phylogenetic signal, uh, the average bootstrap support of the gene tree. And each dot here is a gene, uh, here on and this gray hexagon uh, is the centroid of that distribution. And we can see that if we go with uh, approach A, if we try to reduce biases in our data set, we're not only doing that, uh, reducing the biases that are present, but we're also reducing the phylogenetic signal. So we're set something in a way that we're choosing genes that have less phylogenetic signal than we were, if we were doing this at random. Uh, so this is clearly not ideal, but conversely, 
if we try to maximize phylogenetic signal, we also increase systematic bias. And the problem here is that these two variables, uh, bias and signal, are positive, positively correlated with each other, such that we cannot, based on any, any one of those two dimensions individually, we cannot simultaneously optimize both, which would be uh, increasing signal while at the same time decreasing bias. We can either increase both or decrease both. And so instead of doing this, uh, we decided to use an approach based on multiple properties. So, so for each gene in this, in this uh, super matrix, we estimated four different uh, uh, sources of bias, potential sources of bias, three different uh, proxies for phylogenetic signal. And we, we can, you can see that the, all of these variables are to some extent uh, correlated with each other. And the idea here is when we're dealing with single properties one at a time, the pattern of correlation between all of these variables is actually some sort of nuisance factor that we are, are unable to deal with. The idea is if, if we actually use principal components analysis, we can extract information from this correlation uh, pattern. And, and hopefully the approach will give us new dimensions that are combinations of the originals that, that uh, uh, give us access to the main features that, uh, in which these different genes differ in terms of their evolutionary history. And we were surprised as to how well this worked actually. So we found that a first uh, principal component um, axis uh, accounted for roughly 50% of, of variance and, we, and it reflected just the rate of evolution of the gene. We estimated rate of evolution independently. We, we saw that uh, PC1 and, and this in, uh, independent estimate order genes in the exact same way. And PC2, on the other hand, we believe uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an accurate proxy for the phylogenetic usefulness of loci. And we've, we've tested this in a number of ways, and we've been able to show that subsampling genes based on the score they attain in PC2 allow us to optimize all of these seven dimensions of these multivariate problems simultaneously. So we can increase average support, uh, average bootstrap support, decrease gene tree error, decrease the percentage of invariant size, and decrease all four potential sources of biases. But we do this automatically. Uh, and without having to choose any one of them. Uh, and, and the importance here is that all these variables are, are optimized simultaneously when we subsample based on just PC2. And so we ended up selecting 50 loci, uh, the top scoring 50 loci uh, along PC2 and combining it with morphology and stratigraphy. And we waited nine, 10 months to get a tree uh, because like I said, this, these analyses are very time consuming. Uh, and I'm going to show, I'm going to zoom in into different regions of the tr this tree to show you some interesting results. So this plate over here uh, is a plate that contains the sand dollars, the sea biscuits, another plate of extant, extant uh, echinoids, um, and everything else that is shown here, that is named here, uh, are caciduloids. So we've taken what was supposed to be a paraphyletic grade, and we turned it into three monophyletic clades. Two of these clades are in fact contained within the clade defined bracketed by the sea biscuits and the sand dollars. So they're part of that clade in, and, and these include all of the extant caciduloids, but also all of the recent uh, fossil record. Uh, most of the Cenozoic diversity of caciduloids is, is actually within this clade. And all of the relatively old diversity of uh, previously assigned to caciduloids, uh, all the Mesozoic diversity is left behind. And so these are specifically the lineages that if included within this clade would have pushed the origin, the last common ancestor of the sand dollars and the sea biscuits towards implausibly old ages. And they don't do that because we resolve them outside of this clade. And so this is very exciting. We've, we've uh, advanced a lot our understanding of how these lineages are interrelated, what their time of, or, uh, of divergence is. But we also can explore for the first time the steps that took place towards the assembly of the unique body plan of the sand dollars and the sea biscuits. And so some of the traditional uh, characters that were supposed to lend support to their monophyletic uh, origin um, turn in this phylogeny to have been actually uh, evolved independently twice, uh, once in each clade. Other features that uh, they share actually did evolve for the first time in their last common ancestor and have since reversed secondarily in some of the caciduloids that now live within this plate. And I should point out that this, that we can only tease apart these two sort of uh, evolutionary patterns, reversals and convergences, because we have a tree that samples extinct lineages. And it's this, the traits that these fossil terminals share or do not share 
with the sandars and the sea biscuits that, that allows us to, to tease apart these two different evolutionary phenomena and understand better how the unique morphology of the sandars uh, came to exist. The other region that I want to talk a little bit about is this uh, right at the base of the tree. So here in red, uh, I, I highlighted the sideroids. The sideroids, uh, both uh, based on morphology and molecular data, are recovered as the sister group to all other crown echinoids, which are the U echinoids. But as you can see, the earliest fossils that are currently assigned to sideroids fall outside of this, of this clade, and in fact, fall outside of crown echinoids, um, um, which, which is the, the node that I'm highlighting here. Uh, with this arrow. And the importance of this is that these three families of fossils that fall now uh, for the first time outside of crown echinoidea have up to this point been considered the earliest crown group fossils. Um, and for a long time, it was uh, we were in this situation in which we have these two sister groups that form uh, crown echinoidea. And we had, since, since the sort of mid-Permian to the mid-Triassic, we had only fossils on the sideroid side. And it was perplexing to many why we had such a good diversity of fossils that we could assign to the sideroids, but no fossil remain that we could possibly as assign to the euechinoids. And we've sort of solved this problem uh, by pointing out if this analysis is in fact correct, correct that neither one of these three families are uh, crown echinoids, they're actually stem echinoids. But as you can see in this, uh, uh, in this phylogeny, the, the time of origin of crown echinoids is still recovered to have been in the middle Permian. And so this, this, this picture more, actually looks more like this. So we've excluded the entire uh, Permian to mid-Triassic fossil record of crown echinoids from the crown, but we still recover uh, more or less the same time of origin. And so if this topology is correct, what we're looking at is that it's likely that we've, we're missing the first 40 million years of, of evolutionary history of crown echinoids that has gone by without uh, leaving any trace that we can confidently assign, at least so far, uh, to crown echinoids, which is something that we should look at uh, with more detail in the future. Um, I've mentioned that there were other phylogenetic uncertainties, uh, some other clays that differ in the position they attain in morphological and molecular trees. Uh, one of that was the position of the kind of thurioids, and although we confirm that molecular and, and morphological signal do conflict uh, regarding whether they resolve this clade, the tip data analysis of morphology alone, so combining morphology with stratigraphy, actually resolves this clade in the exact same position as molecular data does. So this goes to show that implementing a morphological plot at least sometimes can lead to improvements in topologi topological accuracy, which, which uh, um, is a very interesting result. On the other hand, the other uncertainty that we're dealing with is the position of the echinoneos. Once again, we confirm the conflict between morphology and molecules, but we find that our total evidence data analysis uh, results this clade in the same position as molecular data does. And this is despite the fact that we did not include ourselves any molecular data for echinonia in our tree. There are uh, molecular loci sequence for this clade, uh, but there are no transcriptions or genomes, so we did not include, it, include any of this data in our analysis. And regardless, the inclusion of molecular data to other clades of echinoids induces a shift in position of the echinoneoids that's concordant with the place we know they, they, they have been recovered uh, in other publications that included them in their molecular sampling. And so this is interesting also because we, it shows that molecular data can in fact improve the position of plates that are included uh, exclusively using morphological data, such as for example, fossils. And with that, uh, I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to focus on macroevolutionary modeling. And so, um, we decided to, to, to estimate body size for all these, the taxa in this tree, not only because body size uh, is a, an ecologically very relevant trait, but because, also because it's easy to measure and there's a wealth of information out there that can be mined. So most publications include some sort of estimate of the length, width, and height of the test of the echinoids. And sea urchins uh, look exactly like regular ellipsoids. Uh, so we can transform these three body axes into an estimate of the volume that the test occupies, which is a very good should, should be a very good proxy for the body size. Um, and we ended up uh, obtaining um, a lot of data uh, and a lot of observation for, for each one of the species, including our tree. And this is how this data looks when optimized on our phylogeny. These are orders of magnitude of body size. So they go from really small in red to really big in blue. And you can see that they span about five orders of magnitude. And 
they go, uh, sea urchins go from, from the, on their sort of largest body side uh, uh, range from the, the body size occupied by a kind of thuroids, uh, which can be up to 30, 35 centimeters in diameter. And you can see here one of these massive beasts uh, with a, an average coral reef very red for scale. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the extremely miniaturized sand dollars that literally leave among, live among individual grain, grains of sand. And what's interesting about the pattern that we see here in branches is that relatively, relatively few evolutionary changes occur in the deep branches. You see, they all, they all attain this, uh, they're painted with this sort of gray color that means sort of average uh, body sizes. But, but most of the morphological disparity, disparity that's in the data set seems to be accruing relatively late in evolutionary history with, with independent lineages becoming uh, extremely big or ex extremely small over and over again. And when we look at this through the lens of uh, disparity through time, we see that the disparity that we infer existed during the Permian and Triassic doesn't really deviate much from our expectations under a Brownian motion pattern. But after uh, we, go through, we, we, we go into the Jurassic, it starts becoming larger than expected. And in fact, it is significantly larger than expected. Um, and this pattern can be thought of as a, a sort of late burst of morphological disparity. And this is interesting because most paleontological data sets have historically favored an early birth dynamic. And we, we get the, an opposite pattern here. And we were interested to test sort of more mechanistically why this would be the case. And so we uh, fit all of the state-of-the-art models of macroevolution for continuous traits that are out there. And it doesn't really matter uh, exactly what we did. But we ended up favor finding absolute favor for a, the most complex of all of these models. Uh, a model known as, uh, it's, it's a type of uh, multi orsten ullenbeck model. Uh, its name is O-U-M-B-A-Z. And it sort of models uh, the macroevolutionary history of this trade as though it was uh, traversing, lineages were traversing uh, a macroevolutionary adaptive landscape with peaks toward, towards which they're attracted. And the problem with this kind of model and the reason um, most people have been unable to uh, use it uh, is that it routinely fails to be optimized uh, to be fit to empirical data sets because of its extreme complexity. And this is the type of non-uniform process in which different parts of the tree evolve under different, uh, what are called different regimes, which are shown here in different colors. And these regimes require, uh, for, each, for each one of these regimes, we need to uh, estimate a, a number of parameters. So this is an extremely parameter-rich model. And specifically, each regime has its own selective optimum, the, the, the value of the trait to which they are attracted, uh, a strength of selection, uh, an overall rate of evolution, and there's also one extra parameter that is the root value. Uh, so as you can see, if we, if we, include, if we increase the number of, of regimes, we also increase the number of parameters greatly, and this becomes very rapidly impossible to fit to empirical data sets. And the problem also is that um, from the approach that are out there in the literature uh, to fit this type of multi orsten ullenbeck models, we know that fossils improve the model accuracy, the, the accuracy with which we are able to fit these this models. Uh, but most algorithms to fit this type of models only work on ultramatic trees. One of the few that does actually work with fossil tips uh, has a number of issues. So it assumes that a common rate and strength of selection across all regimes. So the regimes only are differing based on their location of the peaks. And that's, that's a valid simplification, but it's something we would actually, we would like to test whether that's, that's, that's reasonable or not, but we can test it because that's the only way that the model works. But we also know that it supports overly complex models. So here, for example, this is the empirical data that Surface gives us for our, our echinoid uh, analysis. And so it favors a, 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 a macroevolutionary OUM model with seven different adaptive peaks. And we know that this is probably too many peaks. Uh, we don't really need seven peaks to accurately describe the evolutionary history of this trait in this tree. And so to solve this, we've extended uh, the surface algorithm so that it continues to merge independent regimes. And you can see that these simpler models that have less independent regimes are suboptimal um, by the standards of surface. But it gives us some sort of uh, place to, to be able to take the simpler models and optimize independent uh, values for the strength of selection and the rate of evolution of each one of these different regimes using a second uh, package. And doing so, we were, we were able to find not only a model that, that uh, is much better in terms of model, model fit, but also is much simpler. So it has only four uh, adaptive peaks instead of seven. 
And if you're interested in doing this, we've implemented this method uh, in, a, in an R package that you can just uh, install like any other R package from GitHub, uh, and it's called extended surface. And so the model itself, uh, like I said, has four selective regimes. So there's a background regime that spans the vast majority of the tree, 72% of the time we're residing in this sort of average background regime. Uh, but occasionally we get plates uh, significantly deviating from what, we, what would be expected from this background uh, regime. And we have specifically seven independent instances of uh, origin of gigantism, four independent origins of small body size, and seven independent miniaturization events. And you can see these adaptive peaks are right here. Uh, these are, again, orders of magnitude, and they're made relative to the location of the ancestral peak. And you can see that these derived peaks differ from this ancestral one by at least one order of magnitude or even up to two orders of magnitude. Um, and if we go back to our diversity disparity, sorry, through time plot, and we plot also superimpose the number of re active regimes that we have in this phylogeny through time. So if we traverse the tree from the root to the tips and we count the number of active regimes as we go through, we see that there, there's some sort of peak uh, of number of regimes that starts uh, increasing towards the late Jurassic and, and culminates in the Cretaceous, after which uh, it sort of becomes stable. And uh, it's likely that this increase in the number of active selective regimes operating on the street uh, is driving this deviation from what we would, would expect be expected under Brownian motion. And this coincides perfectly with what other people have found before using completely different methods and completely different data sets regarding uh, an ecological diversification of sea urchins around the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous coincided with the marine Mesozoic revolution. And so regarding conclusions, uh, I hope I've convinced you that integrated, integrative approaches to phylogenetic inference are crucial to resolve conflicts. And we've seen many examples in which combining different data sources can help us attain congruence. But also we've, we've shown how, they, how, how this type of approach can strongly modify the, the way we think uh, about the relationships between crown and stem lineages uh, in a way that we, we would never have been able to, 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 uh, to sort of resolve if we just assume, uh, just use the fossil record as some sort of uh, proxy for node calibrations and nothing else. Um, I hope I can also convince you that total evidence analysis and tip data in phylogenetics can greatly benefit from the vast resources available in the phylogenomic era and that it's likely that this huge phylogenomic data sets harbor loci that, that are highly phylogenetically useful, probably more so than the traditionally Sanger sequenced uh, genes that are around still mostly because of historical reasons, because 30 or so years ago, it was easy to, to design primers for them, not because they're, they're the best genes that we can possibly get at. And phylogenomic data sets likely uh, can, can harbor genes that are even better performing but in order to find them, we need to design better ways of selecting loci and better ways of understanding the downstream consequences that selecting this set of loci versus that other set of loci has on uh, topology uh, and has on, on divergence times, which is something that we still do not fully understand. But ultimately, I think uh, the, the most important conclusion that I would like to draw is that phylogenomics needs the fossil record and vice versa. The fossil record needs phylogenomics. And this is because genomic data improves the accuracy of phylogenetic inference. It helps us reduce topological uncertainty, but paleontological data improves the accuracy of evolutionary inferences. So it, it reduces uncertainty at the step of, of, of uh, fitting different models and different evolutionary scenarios. And if we really want to get at these deep evolutionary questions, these broad macroevolutionary patterns, we we need to reduce uncertainty simultaneously in both of these dimensions. And that's exactly the way in which genomic, genomic and paleontological data reinforce each other. And with that, uh, I would like to thank the collaborators uh, that have greatly contributed to all the aspects of this talk, uh, my funding sources. And thank you so much for being here and listening to this. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, we have a few questions for you. Yeah. Uh, first one, have you tried using amino acids to avoid saturation and possibly long range attraction? All of the analysis that I've showed is based on amino acid recorded data. Okay. Um, do the subsample loci without morphology recover the same tree as the full genomic data set? And how are this? Oh. 
How are the support similar? And how are the support yeah. similar? Yeah. Uh, yes, the topology we, we tested uh, subsampling, I think, 200, no, 300 loci and 50 loci, the ones that we ended up using. And in both cases, the phylogeny is exactly the same. And all nodes uh, have more than 90% bootstrap support in, in both of those subsample data sets. So it's really interesting that even going down to just 50 loci, we have not only the same tree, but almost absolute support for the exact same relationships. Okay, great. Uh, under what model of morphological evolution did you analyze the morphological partition of your data set? If MKB model was used, what do you think about the lack of realism of this model? Um, yes, this was analyzed under the MKV model, and yes, the model is very simplistic, and for all of us that work to some extent with morphology, it at the first uh, sort of the first reaction is that that simplification seems really problematic. But through both um, my empirical analyses of sea urchins uh, and the simulation approaches that I've uh, shown you today, uh, it does at least seem to be at, at the very least equally um, accurate and even sometimes more accurate than uh, analyzing data under parsimony. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm personally philosophically uh, conflicted by that result, uh, but I'm at the same time confident in the results that the, 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 the phylogenies per se that I'm show, showing you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm, would it be useful to incorporate other taxa for which only one to five loci are available, so so as to take advantage of known exam diversity. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that would have been probably much better. So there's, I think there's about seventy lineages of extant clades that were sampled in this analysis, and only twenty two had molecular data. Uh, so roughly fifty percent of the extant taxa. Uh, we're only con uh, we're only constrained based on morphological data, and we can definitely sample for some of those, uh, get at those, uh, download those mitochondrial loci, and possibly combine combine them to to improve uh, or at least to decrease the amount of missing data that's there in the and the molecular partition, uh, increase the representation of taxa. That, that would be ideal, and, and, and it's something that I probably should have done. Okay, thank you. Mm. Have you used coalescent methods in explorative in exploratory analysis? In this sense, do you have any suspect about events like incomplete lineage sorting happening in your data set? Um, I've I've used both for the first phylogenomic study and this one for the analysis uh, that included exclusively molecular data. I have tested different methods, summary coalescent methods, so so using those estimated gene trees. And, and using astral or some other of those summary policy methods. Um, and the topology has always been exactly the same as the concatenated topology. Um, I have never used uh, phylogenomic data under explicit uh, full likelihood policy methods. So I don't know if those would show the same pattern, but I have not found, uh, at least with this cursory analysis that I performed, I have not found any evidence of incomplete lineage sorting being a problem specifically for this clade and for the very um, um, not very unthorough sampling that I have of diversity. There's about a thousand sea urchin species and I'm only sampling um, 30, 40 here. So, so I'm only getting at very deep divergencies uh, that are probably, that, well, we know that they're very separated in time. So, so there likely are problems elsewhere in the echinoid tree of life in which we should use these methods, but this is not the case for, for the sampling that I have right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin Ramirez says, great talk. Would you, uh, would you design UCE bait targeting the selected loci? Yes, I would, totally. And I hope to do that. Uh -huh in the near future. Um, but that, that would be a, a great next step forward because the, the, the sort of transcriptomic approach becomes rapidly intractable if we actually need to want to expand the molecular sampling and account for, for the entire 1,000 taxa uh, that are alive today. And so some sort of um, uh, approach like UC or, or, or targeted gene sampling um, needs to be performed in that. And that would be um, the ideal next step. Okay, 
Um, last one from here, from Leonardo Silvestre Gomez Rocha. Does this integrated methodology, especially using phylogenomics, work well with problematic groups for molecular studies? For example, difficult to obtain large sample by scarce material, able to extraction, very fast molecular evolution, etc. Um, I think it can provide a, it can provide a, a way forward for those of the for those uh, problematic clades. Uh, we're currently working on, on trying to extend expand this this approach to other clades that uh, that have some sort of history of contentious relationships, uh, including some mollusk lineages and arachnid lineages. And I think that we could probably shed new light into the evolutionary history of those clades with this methodology. Um, to some extent, much of, of the analysis that, that I perform subsampling loci assumes that we know the phylogeny. And if we don't know the phylogeny, then maybe we're not doing this subsampling step uh, correctly. So there's some caveats that need to be taken into account if we are uh, dealing with this sort of uh, contentious relationships. Uh, but I do think it's, it's, it's possible that they would uh, be very useful as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I have an external question. It's yeah. in Spanish. Busco, eh, buscaste si había alguna correlación entre los cambios de la disparidad y eventos a gran escala como extinciones o picos de temperatura? Mm, no. La verdad que eh, no. Traté de no sobreinterpretar eh, la distribución que obtengo de, de disparidad relativa a lo largo del tiempo precisamente porque estamos hablando de un muestreo a nivel de familias y muchos de los patrones. Eh, temo que si uno empieza a correlacionarlos con eventos geográficos o climáticos, eh, estaría extrayendo demasiada información de lo que es un análisis bastante preliminar. Eh, es, dicho, eh, o sea, más allá de eso, eh, actualmente tengo eh, más de 20.000 especímenes de unas... 3.500 especies para las cuales he hecho, he hecho lo mismo. Eh, tengo eh, información sobre su tamaño corporal y me parece que ese dataset eh, sería mucho más eh, eh, relevante para tratar de, de, de estudiar ese tipo de dinámicas más, más, más específicas, con, con un poco de, de mayor detalle. Perfecto, creo que eso sería todo entonces. Muchísimas gracias, Nicolás. No, por favor, muchísimas gracias a ustedes. Well, then if there are no further questions, then we will close this part of the symposium. <clears throat> Anna, Nadia and I, uh, in addition to all of the SVE meeting committee, would like to thank all the five speakers and all the 16 poster presenters for your participation in this symposium. And we are, of course, are also very grateful with all of the attendees <clears throat> of this meeting. They just informed me that we have over 200 attendees via YouTube and Zoom. Um, we also extend our gratitude with the Asociación Paleontológica Argentina for the endorsement and diffusion of the event and for the award for best student poster from the paleontology section. Now, please make sure to head up to Discord for the poster session that will begin shortly. The session will be div divided in two. The first half will be focused on posters one through eight, and the other half for posters nine to 16. In that way, all the poster presenters can also check out the, the work of their colleagues. After the session, we'll have a, a short break where you can hang out in Discord. And remember that the award presentation, the final remarks, and the decision of who will host the next meeting will be at five o'clock of UTC minus five Columbia time in this same Zoom Palio session. And now I will read some of our, our final thoughts that were inspired by the presentations and the discussions that we had uh, during this meeting. I will read them first in English, at least I will try to do so, but the text will appear on the screen if you don't understand me, and afterwards I will read in Spanish. Well, the five previous talks, in addition to several other ones from this meeting, were clear examples of, about the usefulness and importance of fossils in phylogenetic and evolutionary studies. 
The speakers have shown us, among other things, that fossils are much more than simple calibration tools. They highlighted the importance of mor morphological data and the power of combine combined approaches that include both morphology and molecules, fossils and extant data. Fos fossils should be treated as integral parts of phylogenetic and evolutionary studies, since they have the power to change the way we, th we see things in the blink of an eye. We often end up discussing about the problems that arise due to the so-called incompleteness of the fossil record. However, each passing day, we gather an incre incredible amount of data and information about past and present life from that same record, some of which we would have thought to be impossible to obtain just a few years ago. One of the biggest bottlenecks for the, to the advancement of the discipline may lie not in the incompleteness of the fossil record, but in the large amount of data that we are continuously co gathering from the fossil record. The time that it takes us to convert the data into information and the number of people working in this field. Even if, he, if we had the whole tape of life ab available to rewatch, it would be impossible for us to do so during a brief time on Earth. Each fossil contains a different world and a whole life journey within itself. We are just scratching the surface in terms of what we can learn from them, and we invite everyone that wants to participate in this beautiful journey of discovery with us. And now, ahora en español, a ver si me sale un poco mejor. Las cinco charlas que acabamos de escuchar, sumadas a muchas otras charlas que escuchamos en este mismo meeting, fueron claros ejemplos acerca de la utilidad e importancia de los fósiles en estudios de índole filogenética y evolutiva, demostrando, entre otras cosas, que los fósiles son mucho más que simples herramientas de calibración. En esta charla se remarcó una vez más la utilidad de los datos morfológicos y la potencia de los estudios combinados. Los fósiles deben ser tratados como parte integral de los estudios filogenéticos y evolutivos. Ellos tienen el poder de cambiar nuestra forma de ver las cosas en cuestión de segundos. Muchísimas veces nos encontramos discutiendo acerca de los problemas que emergen debido a la llamada incompletitud del registro fósil. Pero cada día que pasa obtenemos una enorme cantidad de datos e información acerca de la vida del pasado y del presente a partir de ese registro. Información que en ciertos casos hubiésemos pensado imposible obtener hace tan solo algunos años. Así que tal vez uno de los mayores cuellos de botella para los avances de nuestra disciplina no se deba a la incompletitud del registro fósil, sino a la, a la enorme cantidad de datos que continuamente estamos obteniendo a partir de dicho registro. El tiempo que nos lleva a obtener esos datos e transformar esos datos en información y la cantidad de personas trabajando en este campo. Aún si tuviéramos a disposición una película de la vida completa para mirar, no sería imposible hacerlo durante nuestra breve estadía en esta tierra. Cada fósil contiene un mundo distinto y una historia de vida dentro de sí mismo. Apenas estamos rasgando la superficie en cuanto a lo que podemos aprender a partir de ellos, invitamos a todo el mundo a participar en este hermoso viaje de descubrimiento y aprendizaje con nosotros. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And, bueno, muy obrigado. See you later. Okay. The, the final session, the final words will be in this same Zoom paleo link. Thank you very much.